Good evening, good evening, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. A very happy new year to you. If it's not too late to wish you a happy new year, 12 days already into the new year. Thanks for joining us for our first live event on the IEA channel of 2021. This is the third in our series of in conversation events in which uh, I sit down and talk to a, a politician, a thought leader or a newsmaker or a think tanker, or in the case of today's guest, somebody who ticks all of those boxes or has done at various parts of his life, um, uh, to hear their views uh, of the world as we see it today from a classical liberal free market perspective. Just before I introduce Introduce our superb guests for this evening. Let me just go through the boring um, housekeeping points that I need to go through. The event is being screened both on Zoom for a, a good number of our audience, but also live on YouTube. If you're on the Zoom side of the call and you want to put a question to our speaker, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom box. Use the chat function if you just want to share links, talk to each other, if you've got any technical issues. But if you actually want to put a question to the speaker, please use the Q&A function. If you're too shy to put a question, but you do have opinions about what questions I should ask, I'm a very democratic kind of guy, and you can upvote questions. So you can go and look at the Q&A box, see what questions people are putting forward. And if you like the sound of one, click on the thumbs up, and I'll tend to take the questions that are towards the top of the list. So, and don't hold back. If a question pops into your mind right away, put it in there right away. You don't need to wait until the conversation between uh, myself and our speaker um, uh, has concluded. Uh, so that's the boring housekeeping out of the way. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce this evening a good friend of mine, a very good friend of the IEA and a fantastic friend of Freedom. Uh, tonight's guest is Douglas Carswell. Uh, it is no exaggeration to say that he has been one of the most influential members of Parliament in the United Kingdom over the last decade. He first became an MP in 2005, was re-elected every single time he ran for office. In 2014, became the first elected member of Parliament ever for the UK Independence Party, representing the constituency of Clacton. He also crucially co-founded Vote Leave, which went on to become the official campaign um, to vote for Brexit in the EU referendum of 2016, and has subsequently, I would argue, changed the landscape and the face of British politics for decades to come. He left party politics and electoral politics in 2017 and has spent some time since doing various things, including writing some books, most recent of which was Progress and Power Sites, in which he argued capitalism is the root of human prosperity, and that throughout history, uh, by limiting free exchange, governments have repeatedly inhibited progress. He's also served as a non-executive director at the Department of Trade, and most importantly of all, sits on the IEA's own advisory council. So he spent a good chunk of his life as a politician, but the fantastic news is this. Finally, he has seen the light and he has joined the brilliant world of think tanks. Just this time last week, on the 5th of January, it was announced that Douglas Carswell is the new president and CEO of the Mississippi Centre for Public Policy, a free market think tank set up in 1991 and based in the state's capital of Jackson, where Douglas joins us from this evening or uh, about lunchtime in his, in, uh, over where he is. So Douglas, a very, very warm welcome uh, to you. Many, many congratulations on your new role. How are you doing and how are you finding Mississippi? Mark, thank you for that very warm, generous introduction. I'm absolutely loving it. Um, I'm really excited. I, I've been in the new role uh, just over a week now. Um, Brexit was completed on uh, Friday, January the 1st and I walked into the new role on Monday, January the 4th. So it was almost this sort of, you couldn't, you couldn't have a more perfect turning of the page and it, it, it feels really good to be here. Um, I've, I've really wanted to come to America and I've really wanted to do something to try and defend freedom and, and liberty in America. About, about a year ago, I, I went to Vermont to Milton Friedman's old house in Vermont 
And I remember just spending a bit of time sitting where he sat and looking at the views that he had looked at while he, he thought his thoughts. And I, I sort of wondered, you know, some of the, the battles for liberty that we had assumed had been won when Friedman was living there, and when Ronald Reagan was in the White House, and when Margaret Thatcher was in office, we're going to have to refight those battles again. And we're going to have to refight them, not just in Britain, but, but here in America. Um, and I, I really want to do something post-Brexit about that. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in American exceptionalism. I think that America is, it really is that, that city on a hill, um, as John Winthrop spoke of 390 years ago. It is, it is an experiment in self-government. And it's an experiment that so far, and I emphasize the word so far, so far has been incredibly successful. It has produced not only this extraordinary republic um, with this incredible material achievement, it's also a moral achievement. America is a force for good in the world. And it, it really saddens me that there are so many people in America who don't appreciate that. And I, I, I think it's incumbent upon people who love liberty everywhere to, to do what they can to make sure we refight and win those battles. And so it's, it's wonderful to have the chance to do it. And I can't think of a place I would rather be than in America. And there's no, no state I would rather be in than here in Mississippi. It's apart from anything, they have the most wonderful food. I discovered that they have something called fried chicken on waffles with maple syrup. And, oh, um, perfect. <laughs> I'm coming. That just sounds wonderful. That's brilliant. Some of the food. Some of the food is off the scale. It's amazing. I'm loving it. I'm really loving it. Well, let me start by asking you a little about the, the state of Mississippi. I've done a little bit of uh, looking into it, it's, um, uh, but I don't know much about it. To my knowledge, I've never visited. I might have done as a very small kid if my parents drove me through there, but I, I don't think I've ever set foot in Mississippi. Um, so most of my knowledge comes from the movie uh, Mississippi Burning, starring my favourite actor, Gene Hackman. Uh, but I've tried to get a more balanced view of, of the, of the state. There's about three million people there. Um, electorally, it's been uh, heavily tended to vote for the Republicans since the 1980s. But it's, of course, not a particularly affluent state, um, by American standards at least. It's often ranked on some metrics as the poorest state in the Union, certainly in the bottom few in terms of income. Doesn't tend to do that great on metrics such as health, education, poverty rates. And according to the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom Index, comparing the 50 states of the USA in terms of its level of freedom, Mississippi comes out 43rd out of 50. You've got your work cut out, haven't you? I kind of assumed it was already a shining beacon of libertarianism out there, Douglas. Doesn't seem to be the case at all. Well, it's interesting, Mark, you, you mentioned two statistics there. One is showing that actually when it comes to economic freedom and economic liberty, we're one of the lowest states in the union. And then you also mentioned that surprise, surprise, when it comes to economic performance, we're amongst the lowest in the union. Those two facts are related because if you lack economic freedom, you lack prosperity. Now, put this, put this in context. Mississippi is a lot wealthier than many, many parts of Western Europe. In fact, if you look at health outcomes, if you look at per capita incomes, Mississippi would outperform, I think I'm right in saying pretty much every part of England with a few exceptions of perhaps Knightsbridge and, and one or two bits of Southeast Surrey. Mississippi is wealthy compared to Western Europe, but it's underperforming compared to the rest of America because it doesn't have as much economic freedom and liberty as the rest of America. I'll give you one really striking thought. High tax, high regulation parts of the states like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles are beginning to see a movement of businesses away from those states to states like Texas to our left, Florida to our right, and Tennessee just above us. What can we do as a state to make ourselves more competitive so those businesses relocate here? That's the sort of thing that I'm really focused on. There's a, a real opportunity. The quality of life here, I think, way out surpasses other parts of America. But what can we do to make it a more business friendly, more competitive environment? There's a huge amount. It's quite striking. Another point you mentioned, you, you alluded to the history of civil rights in this state. And one of the first things I did when I got here, I went to look at the Civil Rights Museum. There's this wonderful civil rights museum here in Jackson. 
and I, I spent a, a lovely afternoon going around it. There's a very striking photo I saw of an African-American with a, a placard which said, I want to be free. And when I looked at that, I thought, hang on, he is basically asking, he was asking to have the founding ideals to include folk like him. He, was, he wanted what Ben Franklin and George Washington and the people who got America going in the first place wanted. Mississippi, I think, has been held back because it hasn't always had that freedom. There, there are a whole bunch of quite restrictive laws in Mississippi. For example, if you're a healthcare provider in Mississippi and you want to open up a new, uh, you want to enter the market, you need something called a certificate of need. You need the permission of a, 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 a license to be able to open a health facility. And, and guess who decides whether you get the certificate of need? Other providers. So you have all these hidden protectionist measures. And that, I think, is what's holding the state back. You've got a sort of crony capitalism rather than a free market capitalism. And if we can change that, we can do what Tennessee and Florida and Texas are doing. And I, I, I think we really can prosper if we make the state more economically free market. That's interesting. Give us a sense of, uh, and I'll, I'll ask a bit about the, the, the Institute and the think tank in a minute, but give us a sense. Look, I appreciate you've only just got your feet under the table. You've been in place for a, a week or so, but where are the sort of battle lines? What are, what are the key things that would have, have to happen in the state of Mississippi for it to become freer? Is it that too many occupations are licensed? Is it that taxes are too high? Is it that planning regulations are a nightmare? What what in your early days in the role are you thinking, you know, these are these are the battlegrounds I need to go and fight on in order to extend freedom in this state? Occupational licensing is a real problem. The, the centre fought a case on behalf of someone who was selling their services as a hair braider. And because they hadn't done the requisite number of hours training to be a hair braider and they hadn't been certified, they couldn't do it. And there are far too many occupations in this state where you need to be certified. And it's a, it's a sort of, um, it, it's, a, it's a cartel where you have a sort of an aristocracy of, of labor, of those who've already been certified keeping new entrants out. And that's a real problem. You've got these certificates of need, which really hinder the uh, expanded provision of, of healthcare. There's a real problem with education as well. I, I think school choice is something that has really raised standards. Um, if you look at the neighboring state, Louisiana, since Katrina, Almost by accident, Louisiana adopted a program where the state stopped trying to run the education system and went into simply contracting providers to provide education services and thereby giving mums and dads choice. It's, it's wildly popular in Louisiana and it's raised standards in that state, standards of education. We need to look at how we can introduce meaningful school choice in, in the state of Mississippi. So there are public service and, and healthcare reforms economic reforms and fundamentally there's a problem in that the public sector is is too big um, crowding out is a concept that you'll be familiar with if if government and federal agencies are spending and pouring money into a state they talk about economic development but it doesn't actually generate wealth it doesn't lead to economic growth and i think we need to move away from an economic development model at the behest of remote officials in dc and we need to look at what we can do in terms of tax breaks for businesses to make state uh, businesses in the state far more competitive. There's a huge amount to do. But in the UK, if you were fighting these battles, you would, you would be persuading opinion, you would be reaching out to public policymakers. One of the wonderful things about America is you have a constitution, uh, uh, not just a federal constitution, you have a state constitution. And the Mississippi constitution allows an organization like us to have a litigation arm, which we have, so that we can take legal action to enforce individuals' constitutional rights. And, and we do this and we're looking to increase uh, the way we do this so that we, we fight battles on behalf of small business owners. We're told they can't expand the services. Um, we're, we're currently fighting a case for a healthcare provider who's been told he's not allowed to provide uh, customers with his services because he doesn't have a certificate of need. There are all sorts of things you can do to actually fight those legal battles. So we're, we're, we're already stuck into the fight, but I'm, I'm looking to sort of ramp up what we're doing. Okay, and uh, let me give you a couple of minutes just to do the advert, or sorry, I should call it the commercial. Um, uh, the 
tell us a little bit about the Institute itself. Uh, you've mentioned that, that, that uh, and I've noticed this a lot about think tanks in America, the constitutional framework means that the route of litigation is often a, a successful way of pursuing the, the cause of freedom, less so, I think, in the, the United Kingdom. But um, what is the Mississippi Center for Public Policy? How does it go about its mission of trying to spread freedom? Are you typically producing research? Are you typically uh, litigating? Are you talking to state legislatures? Are you doing all of those things? Are you going to be broadcasting on YouTube in future? Give me a, give me an indication of what uh, what output I'll be watching from this side of the pond every time I click on your website, which we've linked in the chat, and we'll make sure it's in the YouTube chat as well. Well, yeah, thank, if you look at our website, mspolicy.org, you'll see that there are three main areas of activity. Number one is um, policy. We've got a great um, document which was written before I came here, but it's very well researched and it's really our roadmap. It's called High Rate of Freedom. And it's a one, you know, I, I like to think that Margaret Thatcher and Milton Friedman would approve of it. It looks at the specific conditions and restraints and restrictions in the state and it sets out what we can do about this. Um, and so we've got this great policy program. We, we work with lawmakers in the legislature just around the corner. And we've got a great team here who draft bills and help steer bills through. We, we put something like 30 bills through the legislature last year, about seven of which became law. And some of them are really quite significant. Um, you know, they, they, they actually managed to achieve meaningful free market change. And that's something I think, you know, we, we, we are incredibly proud of and we need to scale up. As I mentioned, we've got a litigation arm and this allows us to not just, it's valuable as a think tank, not simply because it allows you to affect change. You can, you can issue a, 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 a subpoena against a public official who's violating an individual's constitutional freedoms. That, it's not just important because of that. The knowledge that you can do that means that your output gets to be taken very seriously and people will pay attention. And then the third arm, and this is something that, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what the IEA has done so successfully, and that is outreach. In the old days, if a think tank wanted to communicate, you could simply issue a couple of press releases, do a couple of interviews. The nature of media is changing profoundly. And I think if we're going to be in the business of making the moral case for freedom, we need to find new ways of doing it. And that's something that we're, we're looking to invest heavily in. I don't know if you're familiar with a wonderful organization based not too far from here called FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. What they're doing at a national level is really impressive. And I'm looking to learn lessons to see if we can do on a Mississippi scale what they've done so successfully across America. And those are, those are our three real uh, areas of activity. Let, let me ask you a bit about the, the wider picture in, in the USA. We've had this um, storming of the Capitol. Uh, a lot of people are now referring to America as the disunited states of America. Um, it, it, uh, the Democrats will now have the White House, uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives. But that's just a sort of, I mean, not by much in the, in the case of the winning the presidency, although that's binary, but it wasn't a landslide. And in the Senate, by uh, uh, by, by uh, fifty-one to forty-nine, I think it is, or it might even be on the VPs casting vote. Um, but what's your view of how febrile and divided the USA is? You mentioned in your opening remarks, Douglas, that you know this has been perhaps the most brilliantly successful experiment in freedom in human history. But it's a fairly painful and distraught time in America in general at the moment, isn't it? Um, and perhaps one might say, not obviously an area in which the arena of public debate is particularly rational. I, I, I think it goes without saying, well, actually it doesn't go without saying, I think one needs to say it and all good thinking, right thinking people need to say it. What happened in Washington last week was awful, just inexcusable. But I also think one should look at the fact that the American constitutional system held. The system of safeguards that those founding fathers drafted in that old courthouse in Philadelphia in the long hot summer of 1787, the system held, the system worked. The uh, Caesarian uh, impulse was resisted. The Republic prevailed. There was no Rubicon moment. 
So I, I think we need to recognize that. And however tragic and awful, I think it's also testament to the United States founding fathers and the constitution that the system actually worked. Now, you mentioned the fact that one party, one faction, Madison and Co certainly didn't like factions, but one faction now has control of the federal institutions. Cynics might say um, they never really relinquished control of the administrative state branches of the state, of, of the federal machinery. Uh, I, I think, first of all, we need, to, we need to recognize that the founding fathers also saw this coming. And that's why the role of states, states like Mississippi, and the role that we're doing here as the Mississippi Center for Public Policy is gonna be so important. The great innovations in American public policy have come not from the federal agencies in DC. They've come from the states. I'm thinking Wisconsin welfare reform. I'm thinking um, tax cuts in Texas. I'm thinking school choice in Milwaukee. I'm thinking the kind of innovations that Louisiana The right today. to work stuff has been state uh, led as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And precisely, e even if Republicans ran all the institutions in DC, we still couldn't look to DC to advance liberty. DC is not the friend of our free market Friedman agenda. It's up to us at the state level to, 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 to change things. And I think even more imperative than ever is, 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 is that role to do things at a state level. Um, but, you know, let's not be too despondent. Let's not beat ourselves up over this. America is a force for good in the world. You know, imagine what LBJ would have been like if we knew, if, if, if we had that, if, if we had access to his every utterance on our smartphones. Imagine what Andrew Jackson might have been like if he had a Twitter account. Let's not beat ourselves up. The founding fathers understood what the threats to the Republic were and the Republic, the state of the Republic is good, it has held. Okay, let me, I, I, I want to, I know there's lots of questions coming in about the, the states and your, and your view of it and the, the outcome of the presidential election and, and the rest. I'll come back to that in a moment. I wonder if it's okay with you, Douglas, just to rewind. You mentioned that you sort of turned over a chapter in your, in your career, you're now in Mississippi and you sort of did so, you know, almost mere hours after a uh, full Brexit uh, had been achieved. But let me ask your thoughts on how uh, Brexit has gone. You might still say is going. It's, it's, um, uh, do you think it is mission accomplished? Uh, do you think uh, you were one of the key, key architects of bringing it about um, uh, uh, within the Vote Leave campaign, but one of the uh, public intellectual leaders of the Eurosceptic movement for many years as well? How do you, what's your audit of how the cards have now finally fallen? You know, we're out. It's not obvious to me that my total sum of human freedom has increased enormously since the 1st of January. Should I be disappointed? Or is that just about round the corner? Or is that all still to be fought for? If I had my way, there's been a lot of talk about putting down statues. If I had my way, I'd put up a statue in that empty plinth in Trafalgar Square of Lord Frost, David Frost. I first met him when he was the British ambassador to Denmark, when I was a new MP, and he struck me then as being one of the rare things in the British Foreign Office of a diplomat who recognized Britain had a distinct national interest. He's done an amazing job in negotiating this deal. It's not perfect. Few things that are the product of politicians are, but it's if you had said to me at any point during the long march from when I first met Dan Hannon in the early 90s, right through to June 2016, if you'd said to me at any point during that process that we would end up with this deal, I would have been bowled over with joy. So it's, it's, it's good. But you, you allude to something else, Mark, in, 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 in your question. Now, having self-government doesn't mean that you're going to be governed wisely. It's, it's up to us. There, there is no they need to do something. There's you, me, and the folk watching this, and your supporters and your contributors and your, 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 your donors. It, it's up to us to make sure that the so-called conservative party does things that are consistent with conservative principles in the free market. I can't help but notice that people in public office find it easier to ban and restrict and curtail things. Okay, maybe some of that curtailment is right. Maybe it's right that we should ban the live export of animals. I don't have a problem with that. I actually think that's a good thing. You know, 
maybe you can convince me that, you know, we shouldn't be using plastic drinking straws, but, you know, where's, where's all the other stuff? Where's the liberalizing stuff? And it seems to me that when it comes to economic freedom and liberty, there is a, a dearth of imagination and verve. The one exception to this, I would say, is what Liz Truss has done at the Department of Trade. Now, I declare an interest. I'm a, I've been a, a, an advisor in that, in that um, effort. But she's done an amazing job of building on, doing in parallel to what David Frost has done, creating these free trade agreements around the world. We need to see that kind of verve and vim in other government departments. Because if we don't, if we, if we carry on with the Blair, Brown, Cameron consensus in terms of what is possible, we're just going to become a stodgy, bureaucratic, third-rate, ex-EU country, rather than the country that we really could be. Do, do you have any thoughts about, other than just having more Liz Truss-like, Vervy and Vimy cabinet ministers, whether there's a uh, a structured way to go about this. I'll ask um, our tech guys to put in the, the Zoom and the YouTube chats uh, an article I wrote for the, the Sunday Telegraph um, uh, a, a few days ago. Uh, I suggested that we should uh, have a default position that anything that was passed by qualified majority voting that the United Kingdom government was against should be for the chopping block. I mean, perhaps we've changed our mind, but as a default, that should go. I actually think we should probably sunset the entire acquis. I, I, I wasn't against cutting and pasting into UK law the EU um, statutes and regulations and directives because you need to provide some certainty. But I'm a bit worried we're all sitting around waiting for Sir Humphrey Appleby to go through it and tell us which bits we can tip X out. I, I would have thought we want to sunset clause the entire lot. Do you think with the groups like the IEA need to come up with uh, not just applauding Liz Trust for doing a great job on trade deals, which I think she has, and she's a, she's a compelling uh, advocate for pro-enterprise liberalizing policies, but actually finding some structured, you know, frameworks to actually go through what we've inherited and to liberalize rather than just sort of pointing at a bit of verve and vim over there and praying for a bit more in some other department. Yeah. Absolutely. I love your article precisely because it offered a strategic approach to this. If we do nothing, the default position within the bureaucracy will be how can we carbon copy the regulatory regime we've got in Europe? We've got to, we've got to systematically go through the acquired body of red tape. We've also got to overturn the precautionary principle, which I think public opinion will now recognise has been a huge inhibitor of scientific innovation and all sorts of other innovation. We need to um, get rid of specific things like the 2001 uh, uh, clinical trials directive, specific bits of uh, uh, regulation. But yeah, we've got to structure it so that the default is to get rid of it, unless there's a compelling reason why we should keep it. And I, I, I accept that there will be some industries where they say, do you know what? We opposed the regulations when they came in, but we've learned to work with them. Let's leave it as is. So I, I think your approach is a very sound and, and a very, very good one. Um, I think there's something more important that we need to do on top of all of that. Part of the problem is that governments have become used to governing not by actually passing what you and I would call law, which is a set of rules that everyone must uh, obey, but statutory instruments as a guide to tell us what to do. And, and then worse than that, you get the government bureaucracies, which are... Um, established on a statutory basis that then issue guidelines, which the courts then adjudicate on, on the basis that somehow the guidance is statute, it's not. So I, I think we need, now that we're self-governing, to overhaul the way in which laws are made and to block off the ways that laws have been made under the auspices of the EU. It, it's simply wrong for ministers to do things by statutory instrument, and this is particularly an important point given what they've been doing with COVID regulation. But again, I, th I think the public would be open to a proposal that, that limits the ability of ministers to legislate by SI, Re returns to the old idea that if, if you want to pass a law, you've got to do what you do here in the state of Mississippi. You've got to get your lawmakers to vote for it. And if you can't do that, forget it. So we've got to rein in the use of statutory instruments and we've got to change the small print so that quango agencies, statutory agencies are no longer able to issue 
guidance that the courts then adjudicate on. This is really, really key. It's absolutely essential, not just for liberty, but for economic competitiveness. Very interesting. Listen, before I come to the questions which are piling up on, on both platforms, um, I want to ask you a bit about the, uh, the COVID situation. Um, the, uh, you're always uh, something of an optimist. You think that uh, free market classical liberals are sort of destined to be on the right side of history, uh, have been to date, will continue to be so. We've seen the most incredible incursions into human freedom pretty universally across the, the globe to tackle this pandemic. I'm not necessarily saying that they weren't justified. I mean, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a problem here to have dealt with. But um, most of the scholars that you and I would look to, uh, Douglas, would warn us that crises, be it a pandemic, be it a war, see a, a, a huge growth in the power of the state, uh, the destruction or curtailment of a vast number of personal liberties. And when the particular emergency has passed, whether that's COVID-19, whether that's the defeat of Nazi Germany, it takes one hell of a long time to win those freedoms back. Worse still, state policymakers tend to think, if we beat Nazi Germany, if we beat COVID-19 through state central planning, give me a list of other problems and we'll defeat those through state central planning. This has made at least the left side of my brain rather pessimistic about where freedom is in the world at the moment and that there might need to be a Herculean effort just to get us back to February 2020. Um, cheer me up. You're always an optimistic kind of fellow. Is it going to be easy? than that? Are there actually ways in which we could see an onward march of freedom uh, that people are probably desperate to see return, you know, to sort of ordinary normal human freedoms? Or are we on the defensive now, just trying to win back things that we, you and I, never thought we'd lose? The real danger, Mark, is not any one particular set of regulations. It's not the rules that ban you from sitting on park benches or drinking coffee as you go on a walk. The real danger is that we have empowered a, a group of people who believe that you can address the trajectory of a virus by top-down design, that regulations governing the distance and the proximity of shoppers can somehow affect these outcomes. If you believe that you can engineer the trajectory of a, a virus by top-down design, you will morph seamlessly into believing you can engineer economic growth and all, all, all those other things by top-down design. I, I don't think you can engineer these things by top-down design. And I suspect that when we look back on this period, you're going to see the area, to put it crudely, uh, 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 the infection rates, the, the, the area under the sombrero, to use John, Boris Johnson's uh, uh, metaphor about squashing the sombrero. It, 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 all we're doing is delaying um, the, the area under the, the graph. We're not, we're, not, we're not postponing it. It's interesting, isn't it? The one thing the state could have done was to actually put the needles in people's arms a bit faster. And they don't seem to have been terribly good at doing the one thing that they could have usefully done. They're much better at confiscating cups of coffee off people walking in parks. What do we do about it? Well, yes, it's going to be difficult to counter the, the, the technocrats that this whole um, disaster has empowered. But I'm always one, and maybe it's because I'm here in sunny Mississippi, but I'm always one to look on the bright side. I suspect that what has happened is so monstrously and grotesquely unfair to young people that a generation is going to come into being, the rising generation, who don't need any lectures from you and me about how awful the nanny state is. They have been denied the freedom to do the stuff that you and I were doing 20 years ago. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm now of an age where I'm quite happy to stay and watch Netflix, but we forced a group of 20 something year olds to do this for months. And I, I think there will be a, an opportunity for people who believe in liberty to make a case to and speak to that rising generation so that they never again trust politicians including some in office today, who believed that actually they, they had all the answers. I, I think that natural distrust is now so deeply in the popular culture, particularly of, of the rising generation. And that gives me, you know, that, that gives the freedmen in me great cause for hope uh, for the future. 
yeah, a sort of scepticism about state power is the, the, the first stages of becoming a kind of classical liberal. I mean, I, I used to grow up hearing people say, oh, why don't they just do this? And, you know, when I was an MP in Clacton, often I would talk to someone and they'd say, you know, why don't they, i.e. the authorities, do something? I imagine that if you were to say to someone in their 20s who's been treated abominably by this process, who's been cooped up in their student digs for the best part of a year, you know, that they're not going to trust the they because they know that the they is actually not very good at, at, at doing anything. And I, I think that, that out of that scepticism is an opportunity for hope for the future. Okay, I knew you were going to be upbeat and positive about it. Thanks, Douglas, you've cheered me up already. I'm now going to come up, I've, I've, I've been monopolising all the questions. I'm now going to come to uh, the questions that have been put through um, uh, by our audience. Forgive me, Douglas, I'm going to machine gun these a bit. I'll, I'll try and group them together a little, but uh, obviously the, the nature of democracy and freedom, as you and I know, is it's messy. So I'm going to, uh, the, the questions won't necessarily have a centrally planned narrative flow. Jamie Murray Wells asks, um, which up-and-coming politicians are you most excited by in terms of flying the flag of freedom? What are the best ways to help these people continue with conviction when they reach the last mile, such as in the cabinet? So that, I think that's a, a kind of UK focused thing. You've mentioned Elizabeth Truss already. I'm going to just merge that. I'm going to try and keep a narrative thread in with a question from Roberto White. Uh, Roberto asks, hi Douglas, thank you for joining us today. I wanted to know what your thoughts are on how the Republican Party can regain credibility after the age of Trump, particularly after the Capitol siege. It seems that if the GOP does not get rid of the Trump name, it will face electoral challenges for some time. So I guess the question is, which are there individuals over on uh, my side of the pond or on your new side of the pond who you think we should keep an eye on? But more strategically, how do we help them? What do you see as the role of think tanks in keeping politicians, making politicians honest, but then keeping them honest? Um, what, a, what a great couple of questions. Um, on my um, English side of the Atlantic, I would say someone to really watch and someone who I think gives me great cause for, for hope and optimism is Liz Truss. Um, I think she's done a great job. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think she's uh, inspirational. I also hear there's a, a guy in Parliament now called Dan Hannan. I don't know if you've come across him. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah. I think you know him even better than I do, yeah. But, but now he is in the legislature. I think, you know, I, I'd love to see him actually involved in a, a, a sort of executive function. I think he's got so much to offer, so much to give. That would be wonderful. On this side of the Atlantic, yes, if you look at the state of the Republicans losing Georgia and all the rest of it, I, I, I know all the problems. But actually, look a little beneath the surface, and there's cause for great hope. There's a wonderful governor called Christy Noen of South Dakota. Look her up on, on social media. She's amazing. She's stellar. She's the sort of person I could see running in, in a few years' time. There's, there's Nikki Haley, who's amazing and wonderful. There's Governor DeSantis in Florida, who's done some wonderful things. There's a, a, a guy called Christopher Sununu, who's the governor of New Hampshire. Now, I mentioned the names of governors. I think, and it's not just because Ronald Reagan was a governor, I think the Republicans, when they, when they choose as their flagship candidates for high office, people who've been successful governors tend to always pretty much get it, get it right. And I think they've got a great talent pool to choose from, and it gives me real optimism. Um, you know, you've got some really A-grade, genuine free market Republican leaders who are absolutely in that Reagan tradition. And boy, I think they can recreate a, a Reagan type coalition. That's interesting. And then let me just push you a little, as I say, I know your, your feet are barely under the desk there. How do you think um, think tanks uh, who are in the policy space, but not in the electoral or party political space, uh, what can we do, organizations like the IA or the Mississippi Center for Public Policy, that these people who, I mean, let me tell you what I'm, what I get a bit sick of, of um, conservative politicians um, in general who I deal with, I won't mention any names, are people who say, Mark, privately, I completely agree with you. 
I said, well, it's no good you agreeing with me privately. I need you to agree with me publicly. I need you to do so. If publicly you're voting against this or giving speeches against it or, to, or saying how wrong I am on the media, that's no good that I know that in your, in your head you, you secretly agree with me. What do you think our role is without getting sucked into the kind of electoral party political process, which groups like yours and mine want to avoid, that... We encourage the Nikki Haley's, the Liz Trusses and the rest to be true to uh, classical liberal free market principles when they actually have the power to do so. And where they have the awkward test, a test that you've faced in your career, Douglas, of, of, of the art of the impossible, or the, the art of the possible. Our job is to sort of think the unthinkable. Politicians' job is the art of the possible. How do we bridge that gap, you and I, in our jobs? It's funny, when I was a member of parliament in the UK pushing on the Brexit issue, the number of times I would have a conversation where the person I was trying to persuade of something would say to me, I can't do it because I'm in the cabinet. And I would say, well, what about my job in the cabinet? I, 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 I forwent that um, in pursuit of something that I think is more important than that. So yeah, you're absolutely right. How do you encourage politicians who are absolutely consistent with their core philosophy and principle and, and willing to see it through? You know, Mark, it's all about the Overton window. We talk about Thatcher, and we talk about Reagan, and we, we quite rightly salute them, but they were only possible because of people like Friedman and Alfred Sherman and, and um, what's his name, the, 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 the guy who founded, I'm trying to remember his name, the guy who founded you. Um, Anthony Fisher. Anthony Fisher, absolutely. It's all about as that great man who was involved in the Mackinac Center uh, here in America, uh, Christian, the Overton window. How do we push the Overton window so that when Nikki Haley or Christy Noam or, or D Governor DeSantis says something, it, it, it comes across as sensible and reasonable and compelling? Um, I, I'm convinced that this is, this is our core function, to be the, the intellectual icebreakers for this change. Put it another way, imagine that you have to spend the next week watching exclusively CNN or the BBC. You would, you would eventually, it would it'd probably drive you mad, but assuming it didn't drive you mad, it would give you a pessimistic view about what was possible and it would inculcate in your mind a sense that everything that needed to be done had to be done by they, by the state, by officialdom. We, we need to make sure that the world and the world around us is not one endless episode of CNN. Uh, mm -hmm. Thinking about classrooms, you know, teachers quite often share the values of people on BBC and CNN. You know, exposing your children to, you know, four or five hours of CNN content a day is going to give them a biased view. So we need to refight these battles and we need to do it in a way that normalizes the concept of individual responsibility, of personal choice. We need, I think, particularly in America, to take pride in the country's past. We, we, I think the West, America and Britain have an incredibly exhilarating narrative. They are countries that were instrumental in the achievement of human progress and what we today call globalization. And, and we need to make sure that young people understand that story of our historic, yes, they're imperfect, yes, we didn't get everything right, but making sure that people have a, a good understanding of American and British exceptionalism is absolutely key to this. So, I mean, there's a huge amount we can do and it spills over way beyond politics. It's, it's history, it's economics, it's philosophy. It's also about personal morality. This idea that, you know, each of us must take responsibility for our own actions and not count on they. So you know, you're, you're, you're in the middle of a, a lockdown. You know, it's not they who are gonna make sure that your next door neighbor is um, cared for, it's, it's you. You know, the way we live our lives, I think, should be consistent with this moral philosophy and these moral principles, um, taking individual responsibility. And I, I, I think we can do that, each of us, in all sorts of ways. It's not just a question of retweeting what other people on, on, on Twitter say. I think there are certain things we can do to, to make sure these values are living and breathing and spreading. Very interesting. This comes to uh, two other questions. Um, oh, I should also add, in terms of legislators to watch for, you mentioned our friend uh, Dan Hannan. Uh, the IEA's own academic and research director, Saeed Kamal, has also just been given a peerage. So, uh, uh, so we have another legislator of free market uh, classical liberal principles as well. Um, so I there, think there's another one to watch. Um, a couple I of questions. 
Uh, David Middleton, our former chairman, asked, public opinion seems to want to be told what to do. Can freedom triumph as a small minority attitude? You might want to challenge the premise there. But that ties into another question, which I guess is, is linked to it. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, do you think the UK should adopt a codified constitution like the USA? Um, I, I think Professor Middleton's question is, is, is really good, but I, I disagree with the premise. I, I don't think people are looking to be told what to think and what to do. I think if people are fearful, they will, they will do that. But I, I think fear has been stoked up. Um, and, you know, I, I think history will not judge the actions of certain technocrats in government kindly. I'll put it that way. It, it seems pretty clear to me that fear was stoked up by a, a media that lost any sense of proportion that loved the drama, that loved the, to, they, they all wanted to be the guy asking the, 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 the drama um, question at the, uh, in the press conferences. Um, and I, I think um, there was very little objective questioning of public policy making. Fear meant that, you know, um, people, people worried. And, and so then they latched on to what they were being told. Um, I, I suspect there'll be quite deep-seated resentment once people have recalibrated their assessment of, of, of what the risks have actually been. Um, do we need a codified system in the UK? A absolutely. I mean, we are the country that invented the idea of a codified set of principles. Magna Carta, right? I mean, literally the, the, the big charter. Mm -hmm. um, the Bill of Rights. The Americans have a Bill of Rights, but they basically cut and paste the, the, the English Bill of Rights. Um, it's really important, I think. The Venetians discovered this, we English discovered it, the Americans have perfected it. You need to set out clearly the limits of what government can do. Now, the great danger is if we have a written constitution today, it will be drafted by the sort of wokey left that, um, you know, the, 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 the Blairite cultural ascendancy that proliferates in our cultural and um, political institutions. And it will be a dreadful document. But I, I, I don't think the fact that, um, authorship would be disputed means that we should we should look to codify basic rights. I would like to see a British Bill of Rights that enshrines my freedom of speech, that en enshrines my liberty vis-a-vis -vis my local council, that enshrines my liberty vis-a-vis -vis Matt Hancock. I, I think it's long overdue. Very interesting. There's a few questions that are coming in on the YouTube chat as well. A couple that are actually directed at me, so let me deal with those. Ben Tolhurst asks, capital letters, no less. Who funds you, Mark? Question mark. Um, a, a mixture of people, about 20% of our money comes from big companies. The other 80% comes from individuals or charitable foundations. We don't insist that people put their details into the public domain if they choose to fund us. Our funders can't uh, actually affect uh, anything that we say. And if you want to put that to the test, please write me a check for 10,000 pounds, which I will gladly bank. Um, but see if uh, you can get me to say anything socialist or communist as a consequence. I defy anybody to find anything in the IEA's 60 plus years of publication that isn't consistently free market liberal. So if you want to fund that, please do. We'll take your money as long as it's legal and as long as it's not from a government um, authority to fund any of our work. Uh, but we won't put your details in the public domain. And Jim Bob asked, does the IEA only care about making us efficient economic units? Or do they think issues like replacement levels of migration are important too? Interesting question. I don't want to go down the migration loop, but being an efficient economic unit isn't really our standing point. It's the maximization of human freedom. I mean, if you want to retire early or work fewer hours, that would obviously reduce GDP. Fine, as long as it's your choice. We want individual freedom rather than state freedom. Jake Taylor asks, this is an interesting one, Douglas, on the YouTube site. What is the MCPP position on the environmental agenda? Agenda 2030, Fourth Industrial Revolution, the Great Reset. Are these the real next battles that you and similarly like-minded people on the other side of the pond are going to have to engage in? I mean, like, like many people, I, I, I like having a pleasant environment. And as technology improves and as we have a higher standard of living, we can do things to conserve the environment in a way that would have been unimaginable in the 1950s. Um, lakes and rivers and land is, is, is becoming increasingly less polluted in America. That's because that's what people want and that's a good thing. I, I do fear that we're going to see a big push on this so-called green agenda. 
um, and federal agencies will use this to, to it's a basically a form of command and control under the auspices of um, the green agenda you're going to see a lot of planning you're going to see higher taxes you're going to see restrictions on the ability of human action um, it's the same old um, attempt to dominate other human beings under a new guise and the the um, uh, uh, philosophy that they're using, the cloak that they're using is, is the so-called green agenda. And I, I think we need to be prepared to uh, battle it and to respond to it. Um, I, I really, I think the answer to environmental improvement is free market capitalism and ordinary middle-class folk wanting a better world for them and their children. That is the way to improve the environment. It's not programs from DC. Uh, let me come over to a few more questions. <coughs> These may become more eclectic as time goes on, Douglas, because I can't batch them together so easily. Um, this goes back, this is Randy Mayer, who is um, our chief, um, uh, our COO at the IEA, and used to work for BASF, the major chemical company. This goes back to what you were saying, Douglas, about the precautionary principle, and you were suggesting there might now be some skepticism about it. Andy says, Douglas, the view of industry is that trying to ditch the precautionary principle is a hiding to nothing. It's politically impossible uh, and, uh, and uh, politically impossible and that how it is misapplied as a zero harm principle is the problem. Should the innovation principle be the plausible solution to prevent this? You may have come across this, Douglas, the suggestion is not to scrap the precautionary principle, but Matt Ridley, another uh, very liberal minded legislator, we, uh, another name we could have added to the list, has suggested that we should adopt alongside it an innovation principle, that any policy that comes forward should have to answer the question, will this likely uh, impact negatively on innovation? Conceivably, it could impact positively on innovation. But if the answer is that a new proposal, law or regulation is bad for innovation, like the precautionary principle, that would be a reason to say no to such a proposal. Is that the way to try and become less cautious and have a more sensible balanced, uh, balanced approach to risk in public policy. I mean, when people talk about something being politically impossible, I remember what it felt like in terms of leading the European Union 20 years ago. Big change is possible if you believe it and if your desire for change is founded in morally good principle. Um, I defer a lot to Matt Ridley on this question, A, because he's written a brilliant book and, and, and B, because he's much cleverer and better educated and erudite than I am. Um, much better. It's much better educated than erudite than virtually anybody, Douglas. Don't do yourself down. Um, but one of the reasons why I'm just a little bit cautious about this idea of um, only allowing, um, you know, only allowing things if they don't inhibit innovation is you, you can't really tell what's going to be innovation innovative. Um, it's it's very difficult to know what you don't know. Um, so many of the great changes in my, take for example something as anodyne as text messaging. When text messaging came along, it was put in as a feature, as an afterthought in a model of mobile phones that no one thought would have any real application. Um, you know, in, in Matt Ridley's book, he talks about dozens and dozens of absolutely extraordinary innovations that no one understood to be innovative at the time. So I'm a little bit skeptical about this idea that you can determine what is and what isn't going to inhibit innovation. Let me give you another example. When GDPR regulations came in, we were told that it was going to be good because it would guard our privacy against big data companies. In fact, what GDPR does, it prevents small businesses in places like Clacton from utilizing tools like Facebook to advertise efficiently and effectively because there are restrictions on not, not using email addresses to contact people, but using that information to simply target where you want to spend. And the, the unintended consequences of this are, are, I think, pretty extraordinary. And it, it's a net drag on wealth creation. And it, it fundamentally means small businesses are less able to compete than they would otherwise be. No one, no one could have foreseen that when GDPR came in. So I, I, I'd be a little bit cautious about this idea that one can anticipate what restrictions are and are not going to inhibit innovation. Yeah, it's the Hayek idea that the important things can't really be measured, right? So uh, it, it, um, let me come back to a couple of questions about the states. We've got an anonymous attendee on the Zoom side, but it links in with um, a question that was asked earlier by 
David Vanigas, I hope I pronounced your surname correctly, David, on the YouTube side. On the Zoom side, uh, this person asks, early days, but what does Douglas think we should expect from President Biden? What is the mood in Mississippi about the US choice? And what are their hopes and fears for the new president as far as he's been able to glean so far? That ties in with what David asked. Um, I won't strangle your surname again, David, on the YouTube side. Does Douglas think that his efforts for freedom would be easier or would have been easier under President Trump? The left wing Dems don't look like they're offering much in the way of economic freedom over the next four years. I mean, I, I, I worry a lot about what um, the new administration may try to do in terms of big top down federal initiatives. We're already getting a, a clear idea of, of the kind of things they're going to want to do. And it will involve compulsion. It will involve higher taxes. It will involve using federal fiat. And that's never a good thing. I, I, I do think it's important to remember, though, that you have to go back some time before you can think of a, an occupant of the White House who didn't resort to using the levers of federal power. Um, I mean, one of my favorite American presidents of all time is Calvin Coolidge. Why? Well, people often say, well, he didn't really do anything. Yeah, apart from balance the budget and cut the size of the federal government, he didn't do much at all. Um, there is a, a, a good model. Um, Ronald Reagan was good, but a lot of Republicans since have done things that have basically interfered in what should be local decision-making processes. But cast your mind back to when Clinton got elected and it looked as if his side had levers, uh, had all the levers of control in, in DC. It galvanized the Republicans to come up with the Gingrich contract with America, which within two years had basically neutered Clinton's ability to do stuff. And actually, I would argue, make Clinton quite a good president because he then had to come to terms with the Republican agenda. He had to allow Wisconsin welfare reform. He had to balance the budget. Clinton actually balanced the budget pretty well. So I don't despair. Um, the American democratic system means that when people grow sick of big government Nancy Pelosi initiatives, and that may happen sooner rather than later, perhaps by next Thursday or, or, or you know, by, by the end of the summer, um, they can pretty soon do something about it. It's not like the British system where if you give them a majority for five years, you, you, you're left grumbling about it. Change can happen. And I think if states like Mississippi take the initiative and don't wait for federal um, fiat, I, I think we could do things at a local level and start to build that um, drive for change. Um, now I'm, I'm not aligned to the Democrats. I'm not aligned to the Republican Party. I'm, 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 I'm the one guy in Mississippi who definitely doesn't get a vote. But I, I think we've got to build a, a movement that wants free market reform at a state level and doesn't look to federal agencies to do it. And um, you know, I think we can do that. It's not about blue or red. It's about making sure that we check the power of the federal government and look to the states for local initiative. Uh, okay, I appreciate we're on the clock, but I'm going to try and squeeze in three more questions, uh, Douglas. Two of them are from friends of mine, but just to prove I'm democratic, uh, the people on the Zoom side can show that, that they are two of the three most upvoted uh, um, uh, questions on the Zoom side. Uh, the first comes from Richard Koch, a uh, friend of mine, who I think you know as, uh, you, you know as well, um, Douglas, the author of the 8020 Principle and the generous sponsor of our annual essay prize looking for free market solutions uh, in a particular areas of policy. This year it's about helping left behind Britain and we'll make sure that there's a link to that essay prize. Um, you can win 50,000 pounds of Richard's hard earned money if you come up with the best answer. We'll make sure we link to uh, details about that in both the Zoom and the YouTube chat. Richard asks Douglas, you are one of the most honest influential politicians. What do you really think about the Conservative Party and the GOP? Um, well, R Richard is an incredibly generous um, supporter of, of you know, liberty. Um, I think both of them are good in parts. Both of them are capable of being very good. Um, when Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher ran their parties, they, they, they ran them in a way that was consistent with free market principles. And, um, you know, 
I, I wouldn't have had any, any hesitation back in the 80s of, of supporting either. Um, I, I can't help but noticing that in, in Britain, the Conservative Party goes through phases where it, it tends to become a party of state action and slightly condescending paternalism. Um, it, I think, was quite paternalistic under David Cameron. Um, he, he came up with an agenda that was actually, you know, based about, you know, well-meaning public school educated people thinking they knew what was best for people who didn't shop at Waitrose. And I'm not sure that was ever really quite a, a compelling proposition. In America, it's a little different. I mean, never forget that in the United States, traditionally the Republican Party tended to be skeptical of free trade and the Democrats have long had a tradition, particularly in the Northeast of the United States, of embracing the free market. So I, I, I think actually you know, there, are, there are signs of great optimism in the Republican Party. I, I earlier mentioned people like uh, Nikki Haley, uh, Christina, Kirsty Noem, uh, Governor DeSantis and others. But actually, never forget you know, that the Democrat governor of Colorado, his name momentarily slips my mind, he, he's, he's pretty good. He's pretty, you know, he, he's pretty in favor of the free market agenda that we subscribe to. So never, never assume that Democrats are the analogous with you know, socialists. They're not. There are actually some pretty good Democrats in, in this state, too. There are some Democrat mayors who do some good things. Um, we, we, we need to shift. You know, Milton Friedman put it beautifully. He said... Our aim should be to make sure that even the wrong people have to do the right thing. And, and so let's not think about Democrats or Republicans, Labour or Tory. Let's make sure that all of them, some people might say all politicians are, 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 are the wrong people, make sure they all end up having to do the right thing. OK, I'm going to try and squeeze in two more. We've got one minute over the clock. The next is on Tom Harris, good, good friend of ours and a, a good friend of the... The IEA has helped us a lot with the uh, Vincent Centre and sits on our advisory council. Tom asks, while it might be desirable to see more scepticism about state power, this is going to your earlier remarks, I think, Douglas, about young people uh, having had the, the freedoms that they value so badly curtailed. Tom says the risk is that we may also see less respect for the rule of law as a result of so much inconsistent, illogical and arbitrarily enforced emergency powers. Does Douglas see some risk that the lasting legacy of the pandemic will be a generation of Britons, and I guess Americans, less respectful of the police? I, I fear this, and I think Tom's question is bang on. I lived in Italy for a while, and I remember talking to some Italian friends of mine who said that there were so many rules and regulations in the part of Italy where we lived that they, they, they almost sort of prided themselves in, in not adhering to the law. And I remember some of them saying... This was normal. You know, if you create too many rules, you create a culture where people think it's smart to avoid the rules and treat authority with contempt. I've been really struck since I've been in Mississippi how sensible most people are about COVID restrictions. And people generally you know, do sensible things, the sorts of things that you, you would expect them to do. But you know, there aren't rules everywhere telling you how many feet apart you can stand and there, there aren't policemen walking around <laughs> threatening to you, you know you you do these things because you you take your responsibility seriously and you know, i think it was um, keith joseph who said if you want people to behave responsibly give them responsibility and if you take responsibility away they will be irresponsible the danger is that we've been so infantilized by a police state nannying us that we, we treat authority with contempt, we treat the police with contempt, which really worries me, and we kind of think it's smart to not obey the law. And I don't think it's ever a good idea to not obey the law. And let me finish with this one, but I'm gonna prohibit you giving the obvious answer. This is from an anonymous attendee. The anonymous attendee asks, uh, and I'll give you a moment to think about this. If Douglas could go back in time and do one thing differently during his political career, what would it be and why? And the answer you're not allowed to give is that you would have turned up in Mississippi earlier, right? I, I can remember about 20 years ago when I visited Texas, I bought a t-shirt, which I've still got, which says on it, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as fast as I could. You may feel the same about the state of Mississippi, but looking back on your career, I think that's an interesting question. Is there something at any stage that you would have done differently? And if so, why? I mean, if I could go back in time, the first thing I would have done is go back, get as much money together as I could and bought Apple um, and written <laughs> to a guy called Jeff Bezos and said, can I come and work for you for nothing? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think we would have all done that. Proof that time travel doesn't exist. Um, do you know what? I, I think I probably would have voted differently on the issue of equal marriage. Um, for me, it was a very difficult issue. And I'm still, yeah, I, I didn't pay a great deal of attention at the time. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry if that's your number one issue. And I didn't, I, and I'm still, it's still not 100% clear to me that there's 100% good and 100% bad. But I, I think I probably got that wrong. And I think I, I, I should have, I should have voted the other way. Um, and, you know, but having said that, you know, you know, there's been such a shift in cultural attitudes since the year I was born, 1971, on, on all sorts of things. And I, I don't think we should, in this age of calling people out, judge people too harshly, who had views that they had 20, 30 years ago that are different to the views they have today. All of us are, have, have, you know, have changed, um, you know, our, our minds on various things. But I, I think I probably should have I probably should have shifted my views on this issue sooner. Um, but, you know, um, there, are, there are one or two other issues I wish I could, or things I could go back and do. I, I was probably a little bit too strident as a Eurosceptic um, in, in, in the early days of Euroscepticism. Um, and, you know, I have great respect for some loyal, patriotic, decent folk who were genuinely worried about what we were proposing. And, you know, I, I think it's understandable they felt that way. And, you know, um, I, I hope that they feel reassured now, but I don't, think, I don't think we should have been quite so strident in the past. Douglas, very interesting. We'll finish on that typically honest and revealing answer from you. Um, thanks very much, Douglas, for joining us for this webinar and YouTube broadcast. We uh, wish all power to your elbow and every success for you in your uh, exciting new role over in Mississippi. As soon as uh, your government and my uh, allows, I hope I can come and visit you in Jackson, Mississippi. It'd be uh, lovely to set foot in the state, which I don't believe I have ever done, one of the few states that I haven't set foot in. It's been an absolute pleasure having you with us, Douglas. Thank you so much for your time and all the well, very best of luck to you. Thank you for having me. And please, as soon as you're able to cross the Atlantic, come and visit Mississippi. It is the best part of America. But certainly will do, certainly will do. Thanks to all of you who have joined us on both the Zoom and the YouTube side. And a special thanks to um, our IEA donors. Without you, we wouldn't be able to engage in any of these activities at all. If you wish us to put your details into the public domain, we will. If you don't, we won't. Uh, but your generous support is what helps us to continue to support and promote classical liberal ideas. If you are watching us on the YouTube side, please be sure to hit the like button if you enjoyed uh, today's broadcast. Uh, hit subscribe and the notification bell. That way you'll be informed of all upcoming IEA broadcasts. But I can give you a sneak preview of four. Uh, we will have up, uh, upcoming In Conversations with Baroness Morgan on Tuesday the 19th of January with Jacob Rees Mogg MP on Tuesday the 26th of January and with David Davis MP on Tuesday the 9th of February. And I'll be returning with the new series of Live with Littlewood, um, not uh, tomorrow, but the following Wednesday, Wednesday the 20th of January at six o'clock. I hope you can join us then. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for engaging. Thanks for all of your questions. Stay safe, stay free, over and out.